to Old Man Metal's Musings, the official podcast of Old Man Metal. Old Man Metal's Musings is a proud part of the Rat Style Review Network. And now, without further ado... Hey, this is Old Man Metal. Hope everyone's doing well, and welcome to the eighth episode of Old Man Metal's Musings, the official podcast of Old Man Metal. Today we're going to take a look at our show beer, 2019 release of Barrel Age 10 Fitty from Oscar Blues, and then we're going to check out another hot sauce of the month, Advanced Tactical Weaponized Star Fruit Death Star OG from Spicy Ninja. So thank you for joining me today, and thanks to everyone who watched the seventh episode. We checked out the black metal collaboration track Nephilim from Norway's By Grief and Florida's Old Cracker, and we looked at the first ever hot sauce of the month, which was Ex Horesco Hot Sauce from Burns and McCoy. I really enjoyed making that episode, and I've gotten a lot of really good feedback about it, so give it a look if you haven't seen it yet. And as always, I want to say thanks to AJ Nemesis for the theme music. That's a song of his called Through the Electric Mist. Uh, when it first premiered, I was looking for show music for the first episode, and the first time I heard it, I said, that is perfect. That's exactly the vibe I want leading into the show. So I asked, and AJ was cool enough to let me use it. So thanks to AJ. Ah, oh, lordy, lordy. I also want to note something that I forgot to mention last time. Uh, as of the last episode, Old Man Metal's Musings is now a part of the Rat Salad Review Network, which is a group of about a dozen podcasts ranging from metal and beer, like this one, to South Park Wrestling and Politics. So if you're looking for a new podcast, check out RatSaladReview.com. And I gotta say, I'm really stoked about the fact that it only took half a dozen episodes of this show for a podcast network to see the value in it and want to add it to their roster. So that's really cool. I appreciate that. So I'd hope to have another episode released well before now, but I got sick for the first time in three years, which really pissed me off. And I had a few weeks of travel for work coming up, so I had to actually take time off and get well from being sick before I got on the road. So that set me back a couple of weeks in terms of uh, my production time. And on top of that, I'm also working on my first real music video. It's not just a visualization like what I've done before, so that's taken up some of my time as well. And the video I'm working on is for one of my favorite songs from an out-of-print Black Thrash album by an artist that's been deceased for almost a decade. The song itself is not even on YouTube, so it will be a legitimate contribution when I get the video done and get it posted. Um, so be on the lookout for that in the hopefully not-too-distant future. And it's been kind of a slow start to the year for me metal-wise, which is just how last year was, so I'm not worried about it, but it's uh, got me to where I don't have as much metal to talk about, or I didn't when I started putting this episode together. So this time I'm going to shoot for a shorter episode. I'm just going to take an in-depth look at the show beer, and uh, we're going to look at the new hot sauce, and then I'm going to plan on the next episode being all new metal, like episode 5 was, and by then I'll have more than enough new metal to talk about. So... All that said, we're going to take a look at today's show beer, a good look at it, and that's the 2019 release of Barrel Age 1050 from Oscar Blues in Longmont, Colorado, and Brevard, North Carolina, and Austin, Texas, because they're in all three places now. And that <clears throat> is this rascal right here that you're no doubt looking at on the background now, or will be shortly. And this is the fourth annual national release of Barrel Age 1050, and this time it was aged for at least eight months in Buffalo Trace and Heaven Hill bourbon barrels, and it clocks in at 12.5% ABV, and that's a full two points over the normal ABV for 1050, which is 10.5%. And 1050 is my favorite Imperial Stout, and that's a style that I love. So saying that it's my favorite Imperial Stout also means that it's one of my favorite beers, period. In fact, I like 1050 so much that a stylized shot of a brandy snifter, probably this one right here, of 1050 and Death Evocation CD, The Chalice of Ages, is the header image for oldmanmetal.com. If you go there and look, the header image up at the top is this beer right here. That's how much I like it. 
year after year, no matter how many barrel-aged Imperial Stout releases I check out, 1050 is always the best. The bourbon character is always perfect. It's never too boozy. It's always nice and smooth. So cheers to Oscar Blues for making it. Cheers to Best Way for stocking it. And cheers to you for being here to enjoy it with me. All that said, let's crack this bad boy open. Look at that. Oh my God, that's beautiful. I also want to thank Oscar Blues again for letting me use some of their images in the podcast. That was really cool of them, and I really appreciate it. So, cheers to you guys again. Mm. Oh my God. So this year, the format changed for Barrel Age 1050. Up until now, it's been in these monster 19.2-ounce stovepipe cans, and with almost 20 ounces of a 10.5% or 12.5% ABV stout, you pretty much better plan on making an evening of it. So this time, they packaged it in four packs of 12-ounce cans, which honestly, a 12-ounce can is a lot more manageable, and it lasts longer, too, because you get four of them instead of just the one. So that's cool. i got to have another. Mm. Oh my God. So I talked about Imperial Stouts a bit back in episode two when I checked out a 2016 Founders KBS that I'd been sitting on for a little too long. Imperial Stouts are big, bold, flavorful dark ales with uh, lots of complex dark roast malt character, and they're usually 9% ABV or more. One of the classic Imperial Stout styles is the Russian Imperial Stout. It was a style of really strong stout brewed in the 1700s by Thrales Brewery in London, and it was exported to Russia to craft Catherine II and her court, thus the name Russian Imperial Stout. Nowadays, Imperial Stouts are often brewed with adjuncts like coffee, chocolate, chili peppers, and all sorts of other delicious stuff, and we call those stouts American Imperial Stouts since they deviate from the traditional recipe. And if you want to know more about Imperial Stouts, I will link the BJCP style notes in the show notes below. So you can take a look at that if you want to learn more. And 1050 is a traditional Russian Imperial Stout. There's no adjuncts. It's just metric shit tons of two-row malt, chocolate malt, roasted barley, and flaked oats. In fact, I tell people that want to know what roasted barley tastes like to try fresh 1050 because that's the deal there. Even though there are no adjuncts, the magic of my yard chemistry during the malt roasting process provides all of the delicious aroma and flavor notes that we expect from an imperial stout. Chocolate, caramel, toffee, cocoa, molasses, and coffee in the case of 1050. And in fresh 1050, those are big, bold, readily discernible flavors. I like 1050 so much that I buy a whole case every year when it comes out. At least I did before I started having to move around so much. And then I'd spend the rest of the year enjoying it, and I'd usually tuck a few back to age even longer. And the longer you age it, the smoother and more blended those flavors get, and the mellower the booze gets. It's like aging a fine whiskey. It just evolves into a different beast altogether. Fresh off the canning line, or aged for two or three years, 1050 is a fantastic beer. So, if this beer is so great, what could you do to make it even better? age it in bourbon barrels. Not only do you get all the benefits of extra aging, you get those amazing bourbon and barrel notes, and bourbon and roasted barley go together like peanut butter and jelly. They are absolutely made for each other. And something that used to drive me nuts about barrel-aged stouts was how often I would get a coconut flavor off the beer when there was absolutely no coconut in the beer. A poster on the forums at Beer Advocate finally cleared it up for me. One of the flavonoids that the beer picks up from the oak barrel is oak lactone, and there are two different isomers of oak lactone, cis oak lactone and trans oak lactone. And the cis isomer is the more strongly coconut of the two. It comes across as coconut and vanilla. Uh, So that's what I was picking up, the cis oak lactone from the barrel. And if 1050 is delicious as it is, with the coconut, vanilla, and bourbon notes from the barrel aging, it's absolutely sublime. And I'm going to drink this whole damn thing before I get halfway through this show, because it's so good. Barrel aging is tricky. The final product can come out with too much bourbon character or not enough, and year after year, Oscar Blues nails it when they barrel age 1050. It doesn't matter how many different barrel aged stouts I try every year, 1050 is always the best. And if you need another reason to drink 1050, there's the hidden message in the name. Cheers to that, too.
So that's a bit about Imperial Stouts and Barrel Aging and 1050. And I've put a link to a really good article about the flavors of barrel aging in the show notes below if you want to learn more about that. And last episode, I started a new segment that I want to do regularly, and that's the hot sauce of the month. Every year, my brother gives me a subscription to a hot sauce of the month club for Christmas, and it's always from Heat Hot Sauce Shop out in California. And they are a great family-owned shop run by Real Chili Heads, and they spend a lot of time tracking down great new hot sauces, like what I do with metal. So I really appreciate where they're coming from with that. Their hot sauce of the month is very well curated. They always make excellent selections. And I figured since I'm getting a great new hot sauce I've never had before every month, I might as well check it out on the show. So that's what this segment is. And last time for episode 7, the inaugural hot sauce of the month was ex Horesco hot sauce from Burns and McCoy. And it was a super hot hot sauce made with a 7-pot Primo pepper. And it was quite tasty. You can check out the whole review on the last episode if you want. And I've given it a good test over the last month. And that's about what I've made it through. Doesn't look like a whole lot. It's about half the bottle. And this stuff is really, really damn hot. And it's obviously not the only hot sauce I've used over the last month. And going through half a bottle of it, I feel like I've gone out of my way to use it as often as possible and give it a good trial. And the final estimate is what the initial estimate was. Two thumbs up. Definitely recommend it. Very hot, very flavorful. It's a good sauce. And like I said, if you want to know more, you can check out the last episode because I talk all about it. The hot sauce of the month this time is actually one from December, I think. It went to another address because uh, I've been moving around. So we're going to fit that one in real quick because it has such a cool name. And like I said before, that name is Advanced Tactical Weaponized Star Fruit Death Star OG. And it's made by Spicy Ninja out of Hawaii. And the Death Star on the bottle is censored out, I guess, for copyright reasons. But like I said last time, when you get a hot sauce of the month from the folks at Heat, it's well wrapped and well packaged, so you don't have to worry about the post band breaking it and having hot sauce leaking in your damn mailbox, because that's no good. So that's what we're looking at this time. Um, get that there where you can see it, and you can probably see it by now in the background too. So, and you can see they censored out the Death Star, like I said. And normally, I would put the hot sauce of the month in the position of honor and bump the show beer over, but um, I'm not going to do that because it's barrel aged 1050, so I'm just going to kick that off to the side and hopefully it's in shot. You can see it. If not, it is what it is. So, this particular hot sauce uses three different peppers, none of which should be unfamiliar. Uh, first off is the habanero, which has been a staple culinary pepper in the Americas for a long, long time. Archaeologists have found domesticated hobs that are almost 9,000 years old, so folks have been roasting themselves out with hobs for a minute. Habaneros are really hot, but they're not super hot. So they're not the same category with some of the million-plus Scoville peppers that have been developed in recent years. And the Spicy Ninja doesn't say what kind of habaneros they used, but if it's a typical orange hob, it's going to clock in somewhere between 100,000 and 350,000 Scoville. And if it's an orange hob, they're really, really tasty, which is why they've been used for culinary purposes for thousands of years. They have a really sweet capsicum chinense fruitiness, and the orange hobs have a lot of it, so they really have a good flavor. And because of that, they're a great base pepper for a fruit-based sauce like this one, which obviously, from the name, has starfruit juice in it. We'll get to that in a minute, but I'm not giving anything away, I hope. So habaneros are a great pepper to start a fruit-based sauce with, but it's really not enough heat for a sauce called Advanced Tactical Weaponized Anything. So Spicy Ninja brings out a super hot for the next pepper, and that's the Notorious Ghost Pepper, or Boot Jalokia, which is another culinary pepper, uh, this time from India. And the Ghost Pepper is a land race capsicum chinense capsicum frutisans hybrid, and it held the Guinness World Book of Records record for, that's almost redundant, isn't it? For Hottest Pepper from 2007 to 2011, and then it was displaced by Nick Wood's Infinity Pepper. Some interesting research by Paul Boslin at New Mexico State University in 2015 explains how super hot peppers can actually be so hot. They don't just store capsaicinoids in the placental membranes that hold the seeds like normal peppers do. 
Super hots like the ghost pepper have capsaicin bearing vesicles on the pericarp tissue as well, and that's the inside surface of the pepper, and that gives them the storage capacity to hold a lot more capsaicin. That being the case, the wrinkly form that a lot of super hots have actually increases their heat capacity even further because that wrinkling increases the available surface area inside the pod. The third pepper in this sauce is the Trinidad Scorpion, and again, like the Habanero, Spicy Ninja don't specify which specific strain they're using. The Trinidad Scorpion is a varietal of Capsicum Chinense that's native to Trinidad and Tobago, and the traditional Trinidad Scorpion is about equal to a hot orange Habanero, maybe 300,000 Scoville, but there are some strains of the Scorpion that are legit super hot, like the Butch T Scorpion, which ranges from 800,000 to 1.5 million Scoville, and the Trinidad Maruga Scorpion, which ranges from 1.2 million to 2 million Scoville. And that is a friggin' beast. 2 million is a son of a bitch. I can tell you that personally. Because I've eaten a 2 million Scoville wing, and it really, really sucked. <laughs> especially at 3 o'clock in the morning, but we won't talk about that because this is a family show. Actually, this isn't a family show, but we still ain't going to talk about it because it's gross. So, the ghost pepper might be the hottest thing in this sauce, or it might be the second hottest. It just depends on which strain of Trinidad Scorpion that Spicy Ninja used. So, taking a look at the ingredients, we see carrots at the top of the list, and you might be thinking, carrots? But that's a main ingredient in some traditional hot sauce styles like the habanero-based sauces of Belize. Marie Sharp's is a well-known example. So it's really not uncommon to see carrots and habanero sauces. And it works pretty well because the flavor and sweetness of the carrots usually plays really nicely off of the flavor and the sweetness of the, and the fruit notes of the habaneros, uh, if you can taste it, which those of us who eat a lot of hot sauce can. Since the carrots are listed first in this case, we know this is probably going to be a fairly carrot-forward sauce, um, probably going to be fairly sweet. We'll find out. Next ingredient, we've got a blend of vinegars as the carriers. We've got white vinegar and apple cider, and cider vinegar is a pretty good choice for a fruited sauce. Again, it, the flavors just play well together. And third come the peppers, and they list them us all in one ingredient. So we don't really know which one of the peppers predominates, but the fact that such hot peppers are just behind the carrier in prominence tells us this is going to be a pretty hot sauce. Then we've got what's probably a pretty good slug of star fruit juice. The star fruit is native to tropical Southeast Asia, and it's used for a wide variety of culinary purposes, as is its juice. It's sweet, but not overly sweet. Uh, typically doesn't exceed 4% sugar. And its taste is described as a mix of apple, pear, grape, and citrus with a tart sour undertone. After the star fruit juice, we have a cut of filtered water. And then we've got some lime juice, which is always a nice contrast to sweeter fruit, I think. And then we've got garlic, which should probably be in every hot sauce, truth be told. And then finally, we've got the least amount of sea salt just to help balance things out, which is important when you're working with sweet sauces. All that said, let's see what we've got. <clears throat> and uh, just like last time, I haven't opened the bottle, so we're going to go into this blind and see what we've got. And if it kills me, it kills me. And if you've been watching the podcast, you've already seen me get killed by something hot once, so yeah, it wouldn't be anything new to watch me roll around and hack and make all sorts of awful noises. So right off the bat, you can see it's not water thin. It's got some body to it, but it's fairly thin. This stuff is going to pour really quick, and I'm hoping, as hot as I think this is, I'm hoping that there's a shaker cap inside of here, but we're going to find out when we open it. And actually, if there is, I'm going to have to take it off to pour it, but that's cool too. So pop it open, and no shaker cap. So this is one you got to be careful with, because you fuck yourself up if you're not. Ooh. So we're going to pour a little bit out here and take a good look at it. And you'll see how easy and how quick it's going to pour. Yeah, you mess yourself up real quick with this stuff, buddy. All right. So looking at it, um, we're going to do an ASTMO review, which is how I do beer reviews, how I do uh, hot sauce reviews, anything like that. And that's appearance, smell, taste, mouthfeel, and overall. And the big difference between beer and hot sauce is the mouthfeel because it's completely different between the two. 
but appearance wise you can see this is a fairly thin but not water thin liquid it is a uniform orange color which is a nice color for a hot sauce it looks like a habanero sauce just if you look at it you're like yeah that looks like a habanero colored sauce um there's no dye in it so that's a natural color which means you could see variation from batch to batch which that's fine too um, and we'll take a close look it is homogenous I don't see any solids or anything like that in it so it's a fairly thin sauce it's got some body to it there's no thickeners in it so that's a natural body there's no xanthan gum or anything listed so um, the smell I could smell the vinegar as soon as I hit it so you can smell the habaneros not really super fruity habaneros but you can smell habanero and I'm getting a, a smell, it almost smells like wing sauce, where you get that, that richness from the butter, which there's no butter in there, so I don't know why I'm getting that. I'm really just getting peppers, just getting the peppers, getting the vinegar, the tang from the vinegar, maybe a little bit of garlic. All right. So it smells about like what you'd expect a hot sauce like that to smell like. A lot of times the thinner sauces, particularly the sauces that are... Um, that are fermented, which it doesn't say that this one was, but a lot of times they'll have fairly simple uh, flavor profiles. There, there won't be like a whole, or odor profiles, aroma profiles, there won't be that much going on with them, it doesn't seem like, in terms of the aroma. And for the taste, we're going to do it the way I like to do it which is on a wing. Whoops. Might need that napkin. Probably going to need that napkin. And we're going to take that old wing there and we're going to douse it with that old sauce and get a good old layer of that sauce on it. And we're going to see what we get. And last time there was a lot of chewing noise on the mic, so this time I'm going to sort of cover the mic with my hand a little bit and try not to sound so obnoxious as I'm chewing. So we'll see how that works. Hmm. It's got a lot of tartness to it right off the bat. The first thing that I pick up on is tart. Not sweet, not fruity, but tart. And um, drop some more of it on the back of the wing. And I'm going to tell you right now, it is pretty friggin' hot. It's smoking me up pretty good. Ooh, that's hot. <clears throat> so I'm getting a bit of the fruit. I'm getting the pepper flavor. And particularly, I'm getting the pepper from the, the flavor from the ghost pepper. And the heat's really kicking in. And this shit is hot. I think this stuff is honest to God hotter than the last one. Whew. Which so I have gotten a good bit of it. We'll put some more on this wing. Oh God, it's burning good. And I'm gonna try to just taste it. I'd say it's fairly well in balance. I got I got the the tart the the bitterish tart at first, but really once I taste it, um, it's a pretty good balance. It's not overly sweet from the fruit. Um, it's fairly, it's, it's got the fruit flavors, it's got the pepper flavors, mostly the ghost pepper flavor. Um, it's hot as the damn devil. Mm. 
And you can definitely taste the vinegar too. It's got a good little vinegar tang to it. Um, so it's got a pretty good flavor. The heat, um, it is extremely hot. I'm sweating um, just from the little bit that I've ingested, which you saw what I poured in the spoon. That's about what I've got left in the spoon. Uh, maybe I'll do that. Uh, you can see what I've got left in the spoon. And uh, little chaser. So the heat, I said I felt like it was maybe a little bit hotter than the last one. I'd say a solid eight and a half on the heat. It's really hot. Got a good bit of burn to it. Um, the burn is almost exclusively front of the mouth, a little bit mid-mouth, very bright burn, if that makes any sense, very intense burn, not a cloying burn, but a lively, awake burn, and it's, it's really, really daggum hot, and it's just about exclusively front of the mouth, lips a little bit, the front of the tongue, nothing in the throat, nothing in the back of the mouth, um, and really not a whole lot on the middle of the tongue either, no creep it comes right on. There's no creep, no, no nothing to it. Um, I'm going to say this is one of the things I always look at. Viscosity and pourability versus the heat level. This thing should probably have a shaker cap on it. Um, if you are using this, you better be damn careful when you pour it because it would be very, very easy to... Excuse me. That was horrible. Very, very, very easy to overdo it. So I'm going to say that about it. Um, really hot. If you do use this stuff, be careful when you pour it because um, it's fairly thin. But uh, I'm gonna say that's a good sauce, man. It reminds me. It reminds me of a wing sauce. Just the cleanness of the flavor. I think that if you wanted to make some really hot wings, this stuff right here would make an excellent wing sauce. I'm gonna be honest with you. I think it really would. And um, coming up on the end of my time here. And I don't feel like having to jump to another video segment. And you know what? I'm going to have to because it's going to hit 28 minutes and the thing's going to time out. So I'm just going to let it happen and keep talking. And I'm going to tell you that uh, my initial evaluation is two thumbs up on this stuff. It's got a good flavor. It's got a shitload of heat. It'll burn you up. And huh, looks like my video is still going. So we'll see if I can close out here because I've said what I'm going to say. Um, good sauce. You know what? I'm cheating you guys if I don't. And I don't want to cheat you guys. And I was just saying my camera cut off. I don't want to cheat you guys because you tune in, you watch this stuff. So I'm going to kill the rest of the sauce. Mm. Myself at the same time, probably. So, you can taste the fruit a bit. I think it'd make a good wing sauce. It definitely tastes like it's already ready to be a wing sauce. All it needs is some butter and shake it up, and I think you'd be good to go. Oh my God, it's hot too. That's cool though. That's what we do it for. It wouldn't be any fucking fun if it wasn't hot. It wouldn't be any good if it wasn't hot. And uh, I'm definitely sweating. Yeah, I think that's a little bit hotter than the last one. Not by a whole lot. They're both stupid hot, but I think it's a little bit hotter. I got one more of these out of the four pack. And I got a special purpose I'm going to put it to. So I got to save that one for another couple of weeks. Then I get to use it. Drink it. Use it. If you use it as a ritual sacrifice, is it using it or drinking it? Well, anyhow. Another week. This is the last of this one. And then it'll be next year for the Barrel Age 1050. And I am burning the hell up. Oh, God, that stuff is hot. 
was one of the beautiful things about being a chili head and developing a tolerance. You can eat something that hot that it sets your whole fucking mouth on fire and gives you an endorphin rush that makes you feel fucking wonderful. And you can still taste a wonderful beer like this, even though your mouth is on fire because you've got a tolerance to the heat. So, that is it for this episode. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed listening to me talk about barrel-aged Imperial Stouts, Tin Fitty, and Advanced Tactical Weaponized Star Fruit Death Star OG. If you did, please take a second and give the video a like. That's really important, and it's an easy way to say thanks for all the time and pain that went into this podcast. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss the next episode. Just click the subscribe button, then click the notification bell. And that's the most important way you can help support my content because I've got to have a thousand subscribers before I can monetize these videos. So if you're not a subscriber, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything but a second. Please go up there and click subscribe. You don't even have to click the damn bell if you don't want to. It's charity for God's sake. So in closing, for this time, I'm Old Man Metal. Thanks again for joining me. If you enjoyed it, tell your friends. If your friends don't like it, get new fucking friends. Until next time, keep those horns up high. Take care. Listening to Old Man Metal's musings. All material depicted is the intellectual property of the copyright holders. Any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is a goddamn shame. Thank you for joining us.